ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning, everybody. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to <clears throat> moderate this session about peace and security in, in Europe after 1918, and especially uh, I'm honored to be entrusted the task by European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. I really appreciate what, what you do, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. So, <clears throat> And I'm also happy to uh, have here with me two excellent historians and, and scholars. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary to introduce them that much, just a few words. Professor Ann Dighton is professor at Wolfson College, Oxford University. She, uh, <coughs> she researched and published intensively, especially about the issues of uh, origins of Cold War and first decade, first decades of Cold War and also about European or maybe better West European integration in, during the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, professor Frederick Desberg uh, <coughs> is, a, is a professor of modern history at University Paris 1 Pantheon Sorbonne, if I say it correctly. Yes, but I, I'm teaching at saint cyr -Colombe. Okay, saint cyr -Colombe. okay. Uh, and uh, his, <coughs> his interest especially is interoperial and French policy towards Eastern Central Europe. He published, among other things, a book about French-Soviet relations and Polish and factor of Poland in, in interwar security issues. So our task, as you know, is to, to speak about peace, Versailles Peace Conference and so on, and then, then security issues afterwards. So we have decided uh, somehow to divide the topic into three subtopics. First, our speakers will address the issues of, of peace conference, peace treaty of Versailles and so on. Uh, then we will speak about the interwar period and second world war and experience taken from 1918 and, and, and so on. And, and then in the third part, uh, we will uh, look on the legacy of all of this for, for today. So we'll see how, how much how, how much close to our present situation it will lead us. So we will still have something like 90 minutes. So definitely there will be, there will be time enough for, for comments, statements, questions from audience. But, uh, but first we would start with, uh, with uh, not so short speaks of our, our panelists. So I would ask Anne Dayton to start with Peace Conference of Versailles and surrounding issues. Thank you very much, Professor Toma. I'm delighted to see anybody here. I'm told that in Romania, life does not begin until 10 o'clock in the morning. So uh, I hope that you have taken off your iPads from sleeping and you've had some coffee, wonderful strong coffee, and you are all ready to hear and I hope to join in the, the discussions that we will have. As you have heard, we're going to have three sections. And the first section will focus upon the period around 1918 itself. And I think it's helpful because I realize that just about everyone in this room, except for me, is listening in your second language or your third language, or possibly your fourth language. And I know at Oxford that our Romanian students are multilingual. Uh, they're very clever as well, but they're multilingual. So if I'm speaking too fast, wave your hands and say, slow down, professor. But let me just say, and I think this is helpful, the two main arguments behind what I'll say over the next few minutes. The first is that I will focus on the United Kingdom, uh, a European power in my conception, but a sort of semi-European power as well. And I think that it's very important for us as historians, and indeed for us today, to understand the peculiarities of the United Kingdom. Um, my argument is that around 1918 that the United Kingdom was genuinely 
a global player and a global leader, if one can use that word with care. That, that has changed over a hundred years. But I ask you to keep that in your mind. The second point is more conceptual. And it is my contention that you cannot build peace, you cannot build international security unless you have some form of domestic security. That is the nature of the foreign policy you can deliver is very much shaped by the domestic environment, what is happening at home. And politicians cannot just think about the external world. They have also to think about their domestic constituency, their voters in a democracy, their fears if there are pressures from outside or inside, or as we now say, transnational pressures that come from groups often other than states. So to hold those two facts in, in, in our minds, I think, can be helpful. So to go back to, to Versailles, the United Kingdom felt itself to be successful by 1918, although the losses on the fields, on the battlefields of France, and indeed of the imperial battlefields, were enormous. So at a time of huge personal loss of many dead and wounded and disabled, of the lack of men in a population that is still very male dominated, we felt ourselves to be leaders. And therefore for Britain much of what was done at Versailles was, in a sense, managerial. It was to generate and manage and try to see a world that was different. I'm not going to give a brief history lesson on Versailles, as I suspect most of you know something about it, but let me just flag up some points. In the European settlement, the dilemma was, of course, Germany and what you do about a power, a major European power, perhaps the major European power that has been defeated on the battlefield. And the Versailles settlement, as you know, called Germany the responsible, the responsable, for the war, and a lot stems from that. So there was a punitive element to Versailles and the accompanying settlements. So that's the first point. The second point is that there was a, a, an inspirational dilemma, an inspirational ambition to create a better world, and that came from many discussions within and between the Allies during the war. The first of those, of course, was to try and figure out what to do in terms of institutions. And so out of this comes the hope through the League of Nations. Alongside that, and this was very perceptively mentioned yesterday as well, was the desire to give minority groupings collective rights. The idea of individual human rights comes from the end of the Second World War, but the idea of rights for collective, collective rights for minorities becomes very important. But we have to remember that much of the new configuration of Europe about which Frédéric will speak in more detail, was emerged from war and not from the Versailles settlement. That is to say, it was war that brought the end of continental empires and the Ottoman Empire on across Europe. And therefore, the shape of the future 
is determined as much by the ending of the war as it is by the Versailles settlement. Secondly, and very closely linked to that, is revolution. And this is very important for the British because the great fear was the spread of communism, the virus of communist revolution across Europe. Now, in terms of practical politics, what the British realized after Versailles is that if you're going to make new international organizations, you have to have the big states on board. And therefore, the withdrawal of the United States from the League settlement, the exclusion of Russia, and later in the interwar period, the exclusion of Germany, seriously undermined these international groups and the League in particular. So the settlement was one that was partial. It was made by men who were appalled themselves at the loss of life in the war, who were navigating from day to day in Paris as they discussed the settlement, who are trying to balance the big picture with the detailed outcome. And as we know, the follow-on treaties, as they're called, often produced results that were less than optimal. So the first point I am making is that the settlement is messy. It produces winners and losers. It produces states with uncertain borders. It attempts to manage a new world, but this is a highly ambitious project. And for my second point, at home, the need for domestic security was very powerful. On the one hand, there were people who felt that there should be no intervention in the follow-on civil wars that took place in Poland and Russia. There were others who felt that the fear of communism should be dealt with as, as strongly as possible. There was also the question of the uncertain demographic shape of Britain, the loss of so many male lives and the social implications of that for those working in Britain. And this picks on to earlier campaigns from, for women to get the vote, for example. And so the effect of social change is very much in the forefront of the politicians of the time, but they really do not know how this will play out over the following decades. So there is a great sense of uncertainty, and many people have described those years between the wars as the dreary years, the, the years of depression, the years of uncertainty. And this is very largely because of the close relationship between what you can do at home and what you do overseas. So I haven't talked much about remembrance here. We talked about that a lot yesterday. But I hope those points will help to trigger some discussion. So I'll turn over to Eric. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you very much. To, to, to you. I, I try not to repeat what Anne Deaton said very, very well about the, the, the 1989-20 peace treaties, but um, the main point is finding peace, and I, I think it's maybe useful to, to talk about the treaties and the perception of the, of the treaties. As, as you know, the Versailles World Order has been fully uh, criticized, firstly because Germany was likely to be um, too weakened and uh, uh, economically too weakened to conduct its own future and it was a, a problem and it was a problem for the European recovery itself. 
and um, the Great Britain and the United States uh, arose this uh, uh, criticism. Uh, another criticism was uh, which took into account the French uh, needs for uh, security uh, concluded that the, the treaty left uh, Germany as an intact and dangerous, uh, dangerous power and people like Marshal Foch uh, but o others too in, 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 in the 20s uh, spoke of a 20 years uh, peace and uh, later in 1948 Winston Churchill uh, proposed to include World War I and World War II into one single war, the 30 years uh, war. So not surprisingly, historians try to find a link between the two world war and the scholars put forth uh, the, the, the question, was World War II a prolongation or an inevitable consequence of the, of the great uh, war? And sometimes the, the, the response was, uh, was uh, affirm affirmative. However, um, the 1919-1920 peace treaties where the object of renewed researches and uh, perception change. And the main idea is, is uh, that, uh, of course, uh, pr the, the, the peace provoked uh, pro problems and, and, and say, gave, gave a, a, a lot, of, a lot of, of reasons, but it was very difficult to, to do uh, in, a, on a, in a other way. And, the most important thing maybe is that the problem was the war, effectively, and Hitler had not made the, the Second World War because of the Versailles Treaty, of course. In fact, the Versailles Peace failed to set up a stable uh, world order, and uh, the responsibility was put on the peace negotiator, on Woodrow Wilson, because he had bring ideas that showed uh, limits like uh, open uh, diplomacy and, uh, and expansion of democracy, eco economic liberalism and, and self-determination in, in a context where, um, where nationalism was stronger maybe in Europe and especially in Central Europe stronger than before the war. That's an important po point. Inner policies, the traumatism of the of the war, um, uh, border issues were uh, and rancors, rancors among the nations were a very important uh, problem. And inside this general consideration about about the peace treaties, France had a responsibility, not well, responsibility of, for the beginning of the war. Yes. She, France shared a part of the responsibilities, of course, but France, Clemenceau government and, uh, in, and uh, all the governments in the following years had to do their job. Then the main problem was the national interest. And what was the national interest? It was influence in Europe and, above all, security, safety of the, of the, of the, of the French um, territory. And it was very difficult for, for France, who appeared like the main victor of the war, the Versailles uh, conference, Paris conference, Paris is in France, so, so uh, Clemenceau was the host, he presided over the debates, of course. France was supposed to be uh, the first world military um, power, and uh, Clemenceau appeared to be very strong because he was the French uh, the French leader. He was Ministry of War, so he controlled everything, in fact, in war and, 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 and peace, at least in the uh, French uh, administra administration. The problem that was that France was exhausted and lost a, long, a lot of, of people, 1.3 1, 1. or 4 million dead, and uh, a lot of wounded, and uh, and uh, 1.4 uh, babies who has not uh, not come on, on, on the came on, on the on the world, and most important maybe was that the victor, French victor, was uh, scared of uh, defeated uh, Germany. There was a French obsession of Germany, 
It existed since um, the French defeat in, in 1970, 1971. It grew at a paroxysmal degree in 1914, and it lasted at various levels during the interwar period, during the Second World War, of course, but even uh, when the uh, European construction began in the 1950s, until the end of the 1950s, and it was, it, it was a very important maybe the main important point for peace in Europe, the question was reconciliation between France and Germany. That happened in, during, the, during the 20s. It fell. It, it happened uh, again at the end of the 1950s. And it's the same problem for every, uh, every European country. A country confronted to, to the war, and I, I, I think today about reconciliation between countries like Poland and Germany, Poland and Russia, and we could, we could uh, continue. Um, the problem of France during the conference was that, uh, of course, French government Clemenceau agreed with the Wilsonian prin principles about uh, self-determination and, and so on. I can say a few words about uh, self-determination. But in the same times, France had to deal with this principle while saving national uh, in interests. And this is ambiguous, but the Versailles Treaty and the peace conferences are ambig ambiguous uh, too. New Principle where, principles where of in, in international relations were here, but all ideas were here, remained. Uh, for instance, priority to conversations and decisions between great powers, powers and not between. There, were, there was no uh, real equality between the states. Wilson advocated uh, equality, but the link of nations showed, like the UN uh, later, that uh, some powers are more equal than, than uh, others. So in this frame, the French national interest was to save the borders and to um, prevent a new uh, aggression war from uh, Germany. And for this, Clemenceau had one main idea, the continuation of uh, the wartime alliance, France, Great Britain, and United States. And it was an alliance with, uh, of big democracies. And this ideological um, a point issue is very uh, important and important today. Among other concerns, uh, Clemenceau was looking for geopolitical guarantees, occupation of Rhineland, for instance, guarantee pacts with Washington and, and London, and, and, and so on. And the question of the safety of France um, prompted Clemenceau to oppose his interlocutors. After having, uh, say me if I'm too, too long, <laughs> if I'm, um, after having initially supported the arguments of Marshal Foch and President uh, Poincaré for the creation of an autonomous buffer state in the Rhineland, it's an example, Clemenceau reached a compromise with uh, Wilson and Lloyd George, namely a temporary uh, occupation. This is uh, a point. But France was uh, open to compromise, compromises with the Allies and sometimes with Germany. So can we talk about the Carthaginian um, uh, peace? <laughs> we were looking for the <laughs> Carthaginian, thank you very much, excuse me for my English. And um, not always, because Clemenceau, for instance, had to accept plebiscites in Europe, and it happened. It happened in Upper Silesia, and Silesia. it happened in the Marienwerde and other territories where people voted, and when they voted, they voted for Germany and not for uh, Poland, for, for, for instance. Of course, the French 
bloc national govern government uh, had to s aimed at strictly enforcing the clauses of the Versailles Treaty in order to, in order to obtain reparation, so war reparations and uh, guarantees security of uh, guarantee security, but in the same time, this very strict and hard policy had no um, no result, and uh, France had to join um, the British way, in in fact, the way of the way of uh, collective security and the way of application of self determination. But it this matter maybe can can stop now and, and uh, okay because if you, we want to talk about self-determination in Central Europe, maybe it could be another part. Okay, thank you. Thank you both of you very much. So this is the end of the first period, and if you agree, we will leave the discussion, the general discussion, after the third period. So we will move from 1918-1919 to the interwar period and to Second World War. But and Could, maybe you wish I, to I, add I something. Just, I would just like to make a, an intervention, an observation on Frédéric's uh, very interesting presentation. You may realize that we didn't talk about this before, and so we have left out between us two very important things. One is economics. You cannot have international security or domestic security without a sound economy. And the idea of regulating labor, for example, emerges through the International Labor Organization um, one of the most resilient branches of the League of Nations and this idea that if you give people workers rights and you regulate their hours you therefore bind them into society so that the temptation of communism is less powerful I mean I think that's terribly important the other point is that uh, we've presented the British and the French as the good boys in the class. Um, this is a total misrepresentation. <laughs> in fact, the French and the Brits were very distrustful of each other. And this is in two big spheres. The first is over um, this desire, as it was seen in, in, in Whitehall, by the French for some kind of revenge. Um, and the distrust of how the French would manage the interwar period. But the other point is imperial rivalry. And we cannot forget that even as the continental empires collapsed, the French and the British increased their empires in the Middle East. Uh, I mentioned yesterday about our mandate for Palestine, which was one of the most well, it has been one of the most disastrous uh, tools, tasks that the British had for I Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine, and the French um, control over Syria and Lebanon, and the very, very intense imperial rivalry that took place. The world was very different in 1918 to the mid-20s, and I think if we present a sense of the good Anglo-French peacemakers, we are giving a very distorted historical picture. So I just make that as a little addendum, an academic footnote, if you like. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I think we will move to the second period. I, I'm afraid we'll have to be a little bit faster, not to monopolize discussion and to leave the audience to speak at the end. Uh, so let's move to the issues of security, European security in the interwar period and then the Second World War and, and uh, the peace finding after Second World War. Maybe it was impossible peace, as was the title of Anne Dayton's book. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, look from, of course, from the Czech perspective, the issues of European security in the interwar period is like a trip from Versailles, then a stop in Genève, and then the final station is Munich. But of course, this is not the only possible perspective. And I, I really appreciated what both of you mentioned, so the interrelation between the issues of domestic security, economy, and international security. And of course, if you look on the 20s and 30s, more and more clouds on the sky, and instead of democracies or emerging democracies of the early 
20s more and more authoritarian regimes and very repressive dictatorships and, and so on. So, uh, again, I would ask both of you uh, to intervene maybe in uh, opposite way. So let's start with Frederick because as we spoke about, you will focus more on the interim period and, and will speak about second fire war and so on, but not exclusively. So please. Thank you. So I uh, begin. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, uh, I focus on French policy in the, in, in Central uh, Europe, and in, in and uh, it was to uh, a question of rivalries. France France had the ambition to replace the German presence in in in, in Central Europe and. Uh, mainly, not only a political and military presence, but um, uh, economic pre presence too. And uh, but France had no means of uh, doing this, uh, of achieving the, the, this policy. And uh, the French policy was a, ma a matter of, uh, of rivalry with with other powers, and especially with with uh, Great Britain, as and explained it. Uh, for instance, I was talking about uh, the plebiscite in uh, Upper Silesia. Upper Silesia was a problem, of course, between German and um, Polish um, population but it was a diplomatic problem between France and, uh, and Great Britain. And uh, France supported uh, the, Pol the Polish uh, view and, uh, and uh, Great Britain was against it. And the, the problem was that after the plebiscite, the problem was not uh, solved and it was brought to, it has been brought to the uh, League of Nations, but in fact, the solution found Partake of the of the of the country of, of Upper Silesia had been found in the uh, at Geneva, but in fact it was a, f a compromise between the French and 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 and, and the British. Um, the French idea of Central Europe was guided by security issues, of course, um, on different at different le levels. And the first level is how to replace the Russian alliance against Germany, and always the German obsession. And France uh, used self-determination as, as, as a way. Um, the French position has been ambiguous on this point. The French government supported self-determination of the peoples, but only when it suited uh, her. Um, from a French point of view, on the new map of Europe, the, the successor states of the former empires had to be associated, associated with big, what the French called big nationalities, the Poles, the Czechs, the, the Romans, uh, Romanians. And uh, the state should not be therefore based on ethnic uh, groups. The French understanding of nationality was based on citizenship and individual rights, not on ethnic groups and collective rights. And for example, and this principle could justify the birth of Yugoslavia. It was not new in 1918 because Napoleon III used this, uh, this principle. But the French goal was to build sustainable states in front of Germany and between Germany and the revolutionary uh, Russia, of uh, course. And, but this conception was very different of the uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire conception that acknowledged collective rights for ethnic uh, group. So it is interesting to consider that the French strategic interests were more important than the principle of uh, self-determination. Until 1917, during the world, First World War, France didn't use this principle because Russia was the ally. It was impossible to support uh, Polish independence with, during <laughs> the alliance with Russia. Of course, and the second point, because I don't want to be too 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 long, um, is about the borders in Europe. It is not a secret for you, but the borders of the state, at least in certain parts of Central Europe, and not always in eastern part where 
um, fait accompli and military actions uh, have drawn the borders. For instance, the, the, the take of Vilnius by, by, the, by, by Poland, for instance. But in a large way, um, French military have drawn the borders, and the, the borders you can find in 1989, or almost the same as in 1919. Uh, uh, and they have been drawn by French militaries. These French militaries were heading uh, commissions of uh, uh, delimitation of the, of the borders. For instance, um, in uh, Danzig, there was a commission headed by French uh, General Dupont, who was uh, at the head of the French uh, military uh, intelligence during, during the, the, the war, and his role was to strictly apply the peace treaties, and he, he worked at the demilitation of the, of the border. So, so we can find the same problem. H how to find peace when um, solutions are guided by one or two uh, big uh, powers, and when 10 years later or 15 years later, during the 30s, this power doesn't want to support allies in, in, in difficulty, and of course the Munich, Munich Conference is a, is, a, is, a, is a good example. I just want to, to end with a, a few words about the situation in 1944-1945, when after the First World War, or at the end of the First World War, I just want to, to recall that General, General de Gaulle uh, in 1944 uh, signed an alliance with the uh, Soviet Union and it's very important for France because in the French uh, mind at this uh, moment security of France can be of course uh, supported by the Americans and by the, um, by the, the, the British but in the most important way by Stalin and uh, the alliance with Stalin in December 44 leads to uh, agree to an agreement with Stalin about Europe, about um, about uh, the Eastern uh, Europe. That, that means that uh, in 44 France abandons the policy of support of the of the Eastern Allies because, of course. What, what could do France for the protection of, uh, of countries like, like, like Pol Poland, for instance? And uh, Christian Fouché, who has been uh, later minister of, of General de Gaulle, was the, France, was the first uh, Western representative in, in, in Poland from the end of uh, 1944, at the moment when the new uh, Polish government had not been recognized by the other other uh, countries. That this is uh, a realist <laughs> policy and uh, with uh, with contradiction, of, of course. But it shows that France had lost a lot of her uh, influence in Europe between the two dates, between 1919 and 1944. Thank you very much. Uh, By 1945, I'd just like to make a point about on the question of memory and remembrance. The political leaders in the United Kingdom had the most difficult experiences, not of the Second World War, but of the First World War of 1914 to 1918. Clement Attlee who was the Prime Minister from 1945 to 1951, had been wounded at Gallipoli twice. His brother was a conscientious objector and had been imprisoned in the UK. Eden lost family, brothers. Macmillan likewise and was wounded and even if we look forward into the 1950s, Winston Churchill, who had been out in South Africa 
as long ago as the Boer War, knew of the searing trauma, I use the word advisedly, trauma of war, when in the 50s, as a very old man, he talked about jaw, jaw, that is talk, not war, war. And so those experiences, those personal experiences, come to shape the way, first of all, we dealt with appeasement in the 30s, and then after the war. And just a quick word on appeasement. Appeasement in British culture acquired a reputation of being a dirty word. Guilty men, etc. But at the time, appeasement had more of a good reputation of people trying to keep peace and security, which we're talking about, by diplomacy and not by the force of arms. And that balance between talking and military intervention is one that runs right through the 20th century and indeed today. The same kind of debates about, for example, Syria, as those are the debates that went on in the 20th century. So the personal experience of war colors the way in which people think about the world. Um, I have to say that with one great proviso, the settlement produced after the end of the Second World War was radical, revolutionary, and very robust. Lessons were learnt. The first lesson, you must not let the United States drift into isolationism. The second lesson, and it was a harsh lesson, is that surrender of Germany must this time be unconditional. Germany is occupied by the four powers, the United States, which essentially becomes a European power, the Soviet Union, Britain and France. So if you're going to defeat, you do the job properly. There was no immediate set of treaty settlements for the other powers. They took place over time. So the post-Second World War settlement was one that lasted till 49, from 45 to 49. What made it impossible, as you made that reference, is that the largest state in Europe was divided. And the division of Germany was technically possible. It started to suit everybody very well, but it was, of course, impossible over the longer period of time. The great proviso over the creation of the Western international system, which is now beginning to crumble, the great proviso was that we dumped the East Europeans. And to use a phrase that Martin Luther used in the 16th century, and I will say it in my English Latin, which I'm sure makes, is more musical in an Italian or Romanian Latin, but it's cuius regio, eius religio. Where the state lands up, the people have to take the ideology on offer. The Americans and the British were not prepared to unpick the territorial settlement that the Soviet Union had secured by 1945. And the discussions in Britain, and I think in France as well, were that there is very little we can do. And sadly, that attitude lasted in British foreign policy thinking throughout the Cold War. In 56, we couldn't intervene in Hungary. Well, we had Suez as well, which was a distraction. But no one was going to intervene nor in Poland, likewise in 68, 
the Cold War division actually suited the French and the British, particularly the British, in terms of immediate stability. So the settlement after the Second World War was essentially at the expense of half of Europe. You could build a peace and you could do what Noel Annan called changing enemies. The enemy, for Britain at least, had shifted from Germany to the Soviet Union. And when that becomes the priority, you have to look at strategy in a different way. So it did build a strong Western European settlement, but it, it wasn't lasting beyond the collapse of the other at that time, the communist East. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Thank you very much. So we'll still have something like 45 minutes, so let's try very briefly to address the issues of today. So you, you mentioned lessons learned. So did we learn any lesson from today's perspective? So I know this is really uh, a lot of topics. So to speak about Cold War integration of Europe, division of Germany, collapse of communist regimes, collapse of Soviet Union, reunification of Germany, enlargement of EU, enlargement of NATO, and what all of this mean historically and so on for Europe. So what is Europe today after Brexit perhaps and but also because of the problems within EU and so on. So let's, it's up on you what, what would you like to address out of those topics and then we will open the discussion with the audience, yes? Do you want me to respond? Um, for me this is very clear. I've explained that I've always thought that you cannot have domestic security and international security separate. With the European Union, our notion of domestic security is extended across the European Union institution. And by security, we mean economic security, social security, and human security, which is a very loose phrase, but it's quite potent all the same. Military alliances by themselves are pretty much a waste of time now. That's why you'll see NATO moving into new areas. Quite apart from doing cyber security, they move into peace building and non uh, purely military initiatives. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I am so distressed about Brexit. There is a notion in Britain that somehow we can be part of Europe, but not part of Europe. And it's nonsense. And at the economic and social, the political and the diplomatic level, we in Britain will be the losers, and it serves us right. But I fear that the European Union will find itself weakened as well. Now, there are some in the UK who would like that, whose real agenda is not just leaving the European Union, but the destruction of the European Union. We're too polite to talk about it much, but there is that agenda there, that we're in a post-EU period. My own feeling is that you don't dismantle until you know where you're going, and that's one of the big lessons of history. So I think that the European Union is weakened. I also think that NATO will be weakened. It's all very well to say, as the British do, that we will have a lot of bilateral alliances. We will be very active in NATO. But if the major partner of the NATO alliance decides to ignore, dismiss, reduce investment in NATO, and you know who I'm talking about. It's all over. It's as simple as that. And so there is a sense in which Britain has moved away. We used traditionally to think of balancing European powers. 
and by leaving the European Union, we are committing ourselves, and I'm afraid you, in two years' time, if I come to Romania, I may need a visa, whereas you in Romania will have access across the European Union. I don't think the enormity of this has actually hit our decision makers. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, only a, a few words. Firstly, to, to say that what Anne has said is very important. Maybe the, the most important um, difficult point of the Brexit is the way that it would be uh, very difficult for people to move, for students to, to move, to learn uh, abroad. And that's the, f the, the way for, for peace. And especially for young people to, to know to know each other. Otherwise, I'm confident that in uh, security, defense matters, maybe it, it won't change so 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 much. Agreements have been signed and, and, and so on. There can be a change of information, well, intelligence, and, and, and so on. I I'm rather optimistic <laughs> more than you may, maybe, but the difficult point is, uh, of course, isolation, isolation of, uh, of, uh, of the continent <laughs> from, from, from um, great, great Britain. And another, another point is the fact that nowadays in Europe, it's not regarding uh, the Brexit, but problem of the borders. Are the borders intangible now? Or, or not, that in, in Europe and outside the European uh, Union, we've seen it with the Crimea, we don't know what will happen in, in, um, in Ukraine and nobody wants to, to wage a war for, for Ukraine. It reminds maybe bad uh, me memories. Um, what is the um, European defense policy? policy? Was it and the, what we call in French the PCSD, the, so the U U European PESCO. PESCO, yes. <laughs> and uh, yes, but with the, the evolution from the Lisbon Treaty and the PSD, uh, what is it? Is it only to protect peace and borders outside outside the the European Union, or, uh, for instance? in Ukraine or for instance in Africa because it's dangerous for, can be dangerous for European security or is it to uh, ensure peace on the continent? According to Brussels, the European defense policy regards outside the, the European uh, Union. What, what, what is it uh, historic, historic, with a historic, if we take a historical background, what happened around the 1950s, around 2025, Locarno treaties, it was the building of a Euro-Atlantic system because the United States were not so isolated as we, as we say, they were very influenced on, on, the, on the continent and there was a real project. There was a European project. Everything that failed in the 20s had been put again on the table in the, in the 50s and it worked with the NATO, with the beginning of European uh, build, building. I, I think that nowadays it's possible to, to make an, an evolution. And the Brexit had a, a good consequence for, uh, for the European Union. <laughs> European leaders wondered if the moment had not, had not come to build something serious, and especially in matters of, of defense. I don't know what will be the, the response, but things had begin to, to, to move. Okay, thank you very much. So now I think it's time to open the discussion and to somehow in, include the, the audience into the discussion. So I would have my questions too, but 
let's start with with your questions, comments, or statements. Please, there is a microphone, and I I, I don't see that much because of the lights, but yeah, there are some people. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm from uh, Tirana, Albania, from the Department of History of University of Tirana, and it was very interesting hearing you and meeting you all here. Uh, I was wondering, because I heard your presentation for both the professors, uh, what, uh, what is your opinion on the American role in, in Europe? So you started with President Wilson, and uh, at that time he was a dreamer, he was considered an utopian man, and so he left, and America got back into isolation. Then the role on the 45, you know, everybody knows. And also what will happen, and what is uh, what happened during the war in ex-Yugoslavia, they were present. And what about now? So my question would be like, can Europe bring uh, its own into that great power that especially uh, Europeans from Southeast Europe are hoping to, to see and we not see it? Are, are, are we going into that direction or, or we will be like uh, always well, willing for uh, American role to be, get played into Europe and to fix our problems and, and things like this? So, and it's a question for both of you because I'm, I'm interested in knowing your opinion. Thank you. Maybe we, we, we try to collect more questions and uh, let's say three and then, then yes, Rafał, please. Rafał Rogulski, European Network. I have um, the question about the role of remembrance or forgetting maybe. What do you think, which, which role uh, um, have, has remembrance uh, to play in, in the procedure of peacekeeping or peace development, uh, should we remember, should we remember together, should we try to remember together, uh, or should we try to forget together? Um, there are only some, some symbolic uh, points which I use, but I'm sure you, you know what I mean uh, behind that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, and then the third question. Gerard Weck, Life Aid International. We have now experienced 100 years in Europe after First World War. Is some opinion how will be next 100 years experience about situation Europe? Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> the last one is, I guess, really difficult question. I'm happy that you too will have to react on it. Uh, uh, okay, so we have you, United States and their role in Europe, the role of remembrance and what will happen in the next century. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for, the, for the, your presentation. Uh, I'm from Romania, from University of Transylvania, Brasov. Uh, I'm interested in what uh, you believe about increasing of nationalism in Europe. Okay, four big questions. Um, the first question, just to, to reiterate, was the US role in Europe. That's not my phone. <laughs> At least I hope it's not my phone. Um, as I said in my earlier presentation, that in a sense the United States became a European power when Germany was occupied after 1945, military occupation to begin with. I think that culturally the influence of the United States is extremely important. Um, if you look at, for example, the efforts of the French to preserve a cultural French film industry against the onslaught of the United States. In Britain we have fallen over and Hollywood is, is everything till we go to Bollywood. Um, there is an irony though, looking back 
after the end of the Cold War. It was very clearly in the United States' interest to be a European power in the Cold War. And in a sense, we needed NATO more as a symbol of unity than as a fighting force. Now, there isn't that same urgency. And the United States is looking elsewhere. The pivot, as the American journals like to call it, the pivot towards China, the pivot towards Asia. And earlier, if you remember, in the 90s, there was the pivot towards South America, which didn't go so far. So I think it's a real question. It, and it's one that may have different answers because the cultural reach of the United States is such that we may not need the physical presence of NATO as well. So that, that's the first question. The second one, um, the specific lessons of learning or forgetting. Um, yeah, well, you know, Mitterrand and Kohl together, that was a very good piece of symbolic remembrance together. Um, going on the battlefields together. However, if there isn't substance in building, then it takes you nowhere, and the younger generations will lose an interest in it. The immediacy of Cole and Mitterrand is, is, is not present for people who are now aged 21. These are both two dead politicians. You know, that there isn't the same immediacy as there was. So remembrance by itself is useless politically, but remembrance coupled with joint activity has value in my view. A um, hundred years on, oh, that's a real tough question. Um, my hope, and this really links to the nationalism question, my hope is that national borders will seem less important, that there will be ideas, groups, specific interests that bind us, not just a notion of nation, not least as many nations have unsettled borders. And the United Kingdom, which appears to have settled borders now, may not have settled borders in the future. Watch this space. Um, and by the same token, I fear populism more than nationalism, to be quite honest. I fear the, the gut reaction of people reading news, information, ideas, which are often half digested, half understood, and exercising their democratic rights to vote on the basis of that. That populism, and populism tends to be very much more negative. You know what the populists don't want. You tend not to know what they do want. Um, so my fears are for populism, of what in the UK we rather unkindly call the left behind, the people for whom globalization hasn't made much sense so far, who can see its benefits elsewhere. So those are not answers, but reflections. Thank you. Um, um, to add something about the American role in Europe and uh, the question of European power, I must say that the, during the 20th century, the Europeans have always called the US to be present in, 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 Europe, in Europe. It was true in the 1920s and um, Europe cannot be a power because it doesn't want to be uh, a political uh, power. So, uh, from a military point of view, it is impossible to, to act without the NATO, that means without the United States. You, you, you talked about the Yugoslavia at the beginning of the 90s and it, it, it was a very good example and we must maybe uh, ask the question of, of today. Um, um, 
some countries in Europe, Poland, Czech, Czech Republic, uh, and, and other, uh, are much more confident on NATO than the European Union to protect their, their, their borders. So it is not a good or a bad thing. It, it's it's a, a fact. The European building cannot be uh, su successful without uh, an Atlantic co cooperation. And I, I think that it will, it will uh, con continue. Um, nothing, nothing much to say about uh, remembrance because what I think that what Anne said was very uh, complete. Common memories are maybe the much more important uh, point. It's important to remember facts. Um, the memory of the First World War is maybe a good example because what I've seen I I in France, of course, is a, a bad habit. What happened happened in France on the Western Front and no nothing happened uh, elsewhere. But um, uh, even if it's sometimes politically uh, used, it's a, a way of make people talk, of make the and for in central French and, and, and the German and to and to organize meetings, events, in order to say we have been enemies of France at this period and w what is it now? So the memories have to be uh, joint memories and, and common me memories through events. And I, I, I'd like to maybe mix my answer of the third question, what experience in, in 100 years and the, the increasing of nationalism, maybe in the same answer, because f for me, the important thing in a success, successful peace uh, finding is citizenship. And uh, you, you, you're right, uh, and of course, populism may be more than nationalism because nationalism, in fact, is the hatred of uh, other of, of outside outside people. And if in 100 years ago, in 100 years uh, further, uh, we can say that um, Europe has been built with the participation of the European citizens, uh, it will be a, a success. And the, the success of populism is the, based on the idea that Europe is against the interest of, of the other people. Thank you. Then, so please, the other, other voices from the audience, please. Um, yes, uh, hello, my name is Stefan Neuser. I'm from the Austrian Office of the um, Austrian Centenary 2018, founding of the Republic 1918. And the questions were partly answered already, so might be short, but it's about nationalism and so on. Um, after World War I, um, <clears throat> when those two big empires um, dissolved, the Ottoman Empire, the austro hungarian Empire, new borders were drawn, leaving lots of mi new minorities within those new states, which also led to more part, the, uh, part of the reasons why um, we had World War II. Uh, if you look at the German-speaking minorities in, the, in, in Czechoslovakia, for instance, and um, after World War II, these problems were so-called so partly solved by ex exchanging large groups of population from, from Germans from Poland and, 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 and Bohemia and so on were moved. And um, when Austria joined the European Union in 1995, um, it, was, it was a very positive feeling. Uh, for the first time, we had regionalism. Remember Alto Adige, southern Tyrol, with German-speaking population, and Trentino, Northern Tyrol and um, parts of Germany formed a new region and, and, off, and opened offices in Brussels. And so you had uh, um, people working together for the first time from Italy, from Austria, from Germany. I remember the then Italian foreign minister, <coughs> Agnelli, was very uh, upset about this because she thought it was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, not, not in the interest of Italy what happened. But what I'm seeing now is that um, uh, these old um, um, things are breaking up again. Um, if I look at um, neighboring Hungary, we live very, very, very close to Hungary. Um, Hungary lost territory to all surrounding countries, also to Austria after World War I. So 
um, this is a very um, um, a present feeling in Hungary that um, that that, that, is still, that we still have open bills, so to say, things to be solved. Um, if, I, if, I, if I look at small museums um, near the um, 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 uh, Czech border, you see lots of um, revisionism, and um, if, if, you, if, if you look at other regions in Europe and in Spain, or the Basques, also in France, partly, um, you see nationalism coming up, resurging again, and 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 I and I and I, and I fear that this is a problem that, that that will grow in the future, and I do not see a real solution to this. I mean, you proposed something about European citizenship, but if you, but if you look at um, the Europeans, like like yesterday, and uh, we heard about only only two percent of Europeans see themselves as Europeans. And if, I, and if I look at my country, people see themselves firstly as a Tyrolean, an Upper Austrian, a Corinthian, and only in a, on the secondary as an Austrian. And then this, uh, on, a, on a European level, we still have this problem. So the ideal would probably be something like United States of Europe to overcome all of these things that started in 1918. But how do we get there? So we do it as, as before. So please, other questions? Yes, Professor Pekar. Thank you. Uh, I have a very particular question to Professor uh, Dayton. It's about appeasement. Uh, from my purpose perspective, as a historian from the former Czechoslovakia, uh, the term appeasement is rather, has a rather negative connotation. So, excuse me, my question is uh, from the field of virtual history, contrafactual history. Uh, which reaction could the Europe expect from Great Britain in the case when the price for appeasement uh, was uh, a part of territory of England, for example, and not a part of territory of Czechoslovakia? So how do you see the border between peace and uh, war and responsibility of Great Britain for, and so on? Yes, please. I have a question about the third part. Is the weakness of the European Union is not that it is a postmodern project. I think it's the best. And if something is postmodern, it has not any aim of any goal. It, you don't know where to go. It's drifting to the left and to the right. And I think that is an, uh, so in this way, the European Union is a nice victim for populism or some other ideology. There is no ideology. And I think that is the real weakness of the European Union. Thank you. As far I don't. Yeah, over there. Thank you. My name is Silvio Mordovan from Bucharest. You assure us the prosperity is a big key and a short key for the international security and for domestic security. Maybe is this uh, somehow an illusion to? how we could explain the crisis from uh, Spain. Because Spain is a democratic country and a rich country, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And so, again, I will ask our speakers to answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, right, our Austrian colleague and his fears of um, a drift backwards. I've always taken the view that integration and open politics in our mass societies of the 20th and 21st century require economic growth. I have no specific answer to your specific question about Austria and its borders and the regional, national, European identities. But the historical evidence indicates that integration 
works when there is a bigger cake to cut. That is, when you have economic growth in the system, people are more flexible. Um, I would add one rider to that. I think in an age of mass communication that you cannot have growth that looks good in the, in the figures but is not shared better. I think it, it, that won't wash anymore. I know we have this new emerging global super elite of the very rich but in terms of national profiles, and Britain is an, an interesting example because inequality rates are increasing, the gap between the very rich and the not rich. And I don't think that is going to wash anymore. So my answer to your question, which is a, you know, it's a huge question, is that you need economic growth, but people have to feel that they're part of the answer because if not, they will come up with other, other solutions. Um, appeasement, yeah, I thought someone would come back to me on that one, <laughs> hello. Um, I think your analogy with Great Britain losing a bit of its territory is, uh, it's good fun. Actually, if the Spaniards want Gibraltar back, I'm quite happy <laughs> for them to have Gibraltar back. There is talk about making a Gibraltese MP come to the British Parliament, which is a nonsense. Um, if bits of countries want to go, the way of doing it is with referendums. And that's what the Catalonians tried and failed, and we come on to Spain in a minute. Uh, we tried it in Scotland, and people voted to stay. If there's another referendum, they might vote to go. But I can assure you that the English army will not invade Edinburgh if they vote to leave and become an independent state. Um, uh, the, the Spanish question is really interesting. and I th I, I'm not a Spanish expert, but my understanding is that it was ha handled in a rather rigid and clumsy way by Madrid. And there would have been ways to deal with these very clever um, Catalonians who have been pushing in many different ways over many years. And what happened was a result of political frustration. Um, on the other hand, you know, Catalonia is as big as Finland in terms of population. And maybe a Europe of regions might be one way forward in answer to the question of what happens in a hundred years time, that you have regions that are smaller. Um, the European Union as a postmodern project, yes indeed, Robin, Robert Cooper has written very powerfully on that. The trouble with postmodern projects is that they seem to work when nothing happens beyond borders. But when borders intervene, or external powers intervene, whether by um, electronic means or physical invasion, the postmodern project is, is, very, is very threatened. However, if you can come up with a better idea, I suggest you write a book about it, because Brussels is on the lookout for big ideas. Thank you. Um, maybe I can't answer the question about appeasement because <laughs> it was <laughs> directly linked to, to, to Great Britain. When should we have stopped appeasement? 1936? Sorry, that's one, yes. a one-line answer. Y yes, but uh, there is uh, a, lo a lot of things to, to talk about, about ap appeasement. For me, from my point of view, the main problem is uh, what to do with the virtual of and, and, and me How, do we have to talk and, and the question is okay, Munich was in certain circumstances um, uh, appeasement policy was, was led by, uh, by a strategy in, in fact, maybe a wrong <laughs> strategy but by a strategy and uh, now, nowadays I, I mentioned U U Ukraine some people don't want to talk with, uh, with Putin. Others say we have to talk with, 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 with Putin. What, what can we do? In 1938, in France, um, people who were uh, in favor 
of um, a firm position against Hitler were called party of war. It's it's very very difficult to 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 to, to answer, and um, uh, you 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 mentioned Tyrol and uh, and uh, the uh, Trianon uh, treaty treaties that were very hard because of because of uh, of demands of French demands of uh, Romanian demands of uh, and, and so on. Um, the the problem now, now nowadays is uh, and it's linked to the question about the, about the crisis of uh, of Catalonia of, of Spain is what can what must be the, the model in Europe Europe of regions you, nation state inside uh, inside uh, Europe inside a federal Europe or not nobody has decided decided from from the the, the 50s maybe uh, the the problem appears when it is politically used when a government give passport to foreign uh, po population it's the beginning of a, of a, of a problem and maybe of a dangerous problem in, in my in my mind um, I enjoy, I like postmodernism in, in music, in uh, archite architecture, <laughs> or maybe in politics. It's, it can be different. We, we, we don't know where, where we go, but uh, we must recall that you, the building of a united Europe starts from a refusal of, 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 war, of war. So we have to find common points in a, in a wealthy <laughs> in a wealthy situation with of course with with something to to to, to, to share but i nevertheless i i, I like this <laughs> this postmodern project even if it's not uh, clear because because it, it must satisfy the majority of of people and it's, it's hard to to find Um, thank you. So we still have something like 10 minutes. Maybe I will misuse my position and I will ask my own question. Uh, so this is about one country which was left aside from our discussion. So it appeared again and again, but Russia. So Russia was an important ally during both wars. It was an important enemy, especially during Cold War, but also in a way between, between wars. Then it seemed, if I can borrow a quote from Napoleon, what the Napoleon used to say about China. It seemed, at least first decade after the collapse of Soviet Union, that Russia is sleeping, but it couldn't last forever. So how, how shall we treat Russia today? So is it again an enemy, an ally? No, it's not an ally, clearly. But uh, I'm, I'm not so sure European Union and, and even NATO have a concise policy towards Russia. So what's your opinion? And please still... Well, I, I, I guess we can. We, we started something like 15 minutes later, so we can finish something like 10 minutes later. So please, other questions if there are. If there are not, so please. Give you the floor, please. No, don't want. If Russia is, if your question is, is Russia an ally or enemy? In fact, geography talks, <laughs> and, and, uh, as always. And um, a lie against who? So it's a partner, I, I think. And it has always been a, a, a partner. Sometimes an enemy, an ideological enemy, from 1917 to 1989, but it's impossible to do without. And it's very dangerous to do against. So my, my, my answer is that, of course, the, we have to, to talk with, uh, with, 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 with Russia, of course, and we have to, to exchange. And we have to be confident into the Russian population, too, if, if the... If the if the Russian government doesn't fit to, to us. History shows that it's a big 
power, it's a big country, it's a huge population, huge and huge uh, land, huge te territory, and of course, it has national interests or imperial interests to, uh, to, to, to defend. My answer is very uh, common, nothing original, of course, but it cannot be, uh, it cannot be uh, an, an enemy, it cannot be an ally in order to share Europe between a, a Western uh, power uh, like France, as Napoleon thought, or at a lesser, at another, another degree, even Charles de Gaulle uh, thought. It cannot be a partner for sharing influence, but it can be a, a partner for peace, as, the, uh, as, it, as it was at the beginning of the, during the 90s, and at the beginnings of the, of the 2000s. Yes, 2000s. You are so well known for asking difficult questions. Um, and this is another one. I, I have no specific answer, but let me give you two scenarios. The first relates to policy. And it is arguable that after 1991, the West got it wrong vis-a-vis -vis Russia. We made some very bad mistakes in the 90s and the 2000s. The Russians were half led to believe in the possibility of a different world which was not realized. And therefore, we have to take some of the blame for how things have developed. That's the first scenario. The second argument is that Russia, and I have to say, like the United Kingdom, and possibly over the next decades, La Belle France, is in the throes of a post-imperial phase. And we don't know how end of empire looks, but we do know that end of empire can generate a, a dream about a world that has gone. It's certainly true for Britain. I think it's true for, for many Russians. An oversensitivity, a feeling of entitlement, which is not given, a sense that as a still great power you can do what you want, a very strong attachment to parts of historical memory and of course Crimea fits in there and, and Ukraine and Belarus, I mean it's a long list and therefore what policymakers have to figure out is how long such a post-imperial reflex can continue for. And I say that with Britain as well, because we have our own problems. You know, the Irish problem is coming to confront us again from 1921. The problems of how we managed end of empire in Kenya, the problems of what we did with Commonwealth citizens, there is a big debate some people will have followed it over Windrush, of the taking in of Commonwealth labor and not treating very well afterwards. The problems of Palestine, empire acquired, mandate acquired, and then given up in a very cavalier fashion in 1948. Hierarchies, you mentioned states not being equal, and that's really important because empire is about unequal states. And what we don't know is what happens when empires dissolve, not just to the, those within the outposts of empire, we know more about that, but what happens to the imperial mindset. And at its most generous, I would suggest that that's part of what's going on in Russia at the moment. Although the Russians have a long-standing capacity to make mischief. And if I can just conclude by saying that in 1946, the Chatham House definition of the Cold War was all mischief short of war. Okay, thank you very much. So I think our time is over. Am I correct?
Uh, so I would like to thank all of you for your attention and for very interesting and important interventions, but uh, especially I would like to thank to our two speakers, Frederick Desbert and, and Dayton, for a really perfect job. Thank you very much. And now I guess we have time for well-deserved coffee. Yep. So thank you. Thank you.